before I do that, I want to tell you, thank you for remembering to record. Um, before I do that, um, I want to just tell you briefly about two events that are coming up that are also co-sponsored by the political sociology section. Um, one is the next in this series, and that will be on March 28th at 3 p.m. And um, if you registered for this event, you'll get an email about that event. Um, but if you didn't register or you want to make sure you're on the list, um, we can drop the registration link in the chat. Um, that panel will include Dana Moss, Laura Acosta Gonzalez, and Ben Case, and they'll be discussing what conflict, war and peace, and especially what people in the U.S. Uh, interested in the U.S. election should know about international conflict right now. Um, the second event is a op-ed writing workshop. It's actually happening earlier, um, uh, which is happening March 22nd from 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's co-sponsored with the Sociologists for Women and uh, for Women in Society, SWS. Um, and that will feature Dr. Stacy Torres, a sociologist who has cracked the code on how to write and get published in popular media. Um, so if you're interested in that, we'll also drop the, we just dropped the registration link in the chat for that as well. Um, so those are some other opportunities for to connect with the political sociologists and others interested in what's happening in the U.S. right now. Um, so without further ado, I want to I'll introduce our three panelists um, and then the, the format for the hour and a half that we've scheduled is that they'll each talk to you in turn for about seven to ten minutes about their research and what they have to say about uh, the issues of race, class, region, gender, and uh, hierarchies in the U.S. as they relate to uh, Trumpism, and conservatism, white Christian nationalism, and so on. Um, and then I'll have some questions for the panelists uh, to talk to each other. And then we'll open it up for audience questions for about the last half hour or so of the time, and we'll end at about five. Uh, so that's the plan. Um, Victoria Asbury serves, uh, so our three panelists, Victoria Asbury will speak first. She's an assistant professor and faculty fellow in the sociology department at New York University. As a sociologist, her academic focus encompasses race, inequality, and American politics. Her research examines the construction, contestation, and assignment of status within the national community. She has publications in Social Psychology Quarterly, the Journal of Communication, um, and several papers under review. Uh, she investigates these topics across various political contexts. Um, she considers the perspectives of white, Black, Latino, and Asian adults in the United States utilizing a range of methods. Um, her work frequently incorporates experiments and innovative quantitative analyses to build upon theoretical and qualitative research foundations. A pivotal aspect of her research is dedicated to uncovering the mechanisms that perpetuate racial stratification and division in American society. Um, so we're very lucky to have her here with us, with us today. Um, next. Luisa godinez Puch is a senior research associate in the Office of Race and Equity Research at the Urban Institute. Luisa holds a PhD in political science from Boston University, a Master of Laws degree from the University of Chicago, and a law degree from Mexico. Luisa's work seats, uh, seats at the intersection between state and local politics and policy and structural racism. In particular, Luisa studies various instances of opportunity hoarding by white communities at the local level, including analyzing the political triggers and effects of cityhood movements. Her work has been published in Urban Affairs Review, Public Health Reports, Ethnopolitics, the Monkey Cage blog of the Washington Post, and by Urban Institute, the Brooking Institution, and the Joint Center for Housing Studies of Harvard University. Um, finally, Samuel L. Perry is a professor of sociology at the University of Oklahoma. He received his PhD at the University of Chicago in 2015. Dr. Perry is among the nation's leading experts on the interplay between conservative Christianity, race, and politics. Within the past 10 years, he has written dozens, probably that's an understatement, of peer-reviewed articles on the topic of white Christian nationalism, which have appeared in social forces, social problems, sociological theory, and numerous other venues. Dr. Perry has also co-authored two books on the subject, Taking, Back America, or Taking America Back for God with Andrew Whitehead and The Flag and the Cross with Phil Gorski. His forthcoming book with Oxford University Press is called Religion for Realists, Why We All Need the Study of Religion. Um, so those are our three esteemed panelists who we're very lucky to have. Um, and without further ado, I will turn it over to um, Victoria Asbury. Please uh, take us away, Dr. Asbury. You got to unmute yourself. Have I unmuted myself? Yes. 
Okay. Classic Zoom issue. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'll give you a brief overview of my work. I'm not going to go into too many details, but I'll give you enough for you to understand where my empirical knowledge on this topic comes from. And so when you come into the United States at an airport, you're faced with two different lines, one for U.S. citizens and permanent residents and one for non-citizens. At first blush, this may be how many of us think about what it means to be American. It's a binary thing. You're either an American citizen or you're not, or you're either truly American or you're not. But in reality, Americanness exists along a graded spectrum or a hierarchy, where some people and groups are perceived as more American and others as less to varying extents. And placement in this hierarchy depends on who's doing the evaluation. And that's what I study in a nutshell. In my research, I argue that Americanness exists on a spectrum, that it is dynamic and can be influenced by political discourse, and that perceptions of Americanness are subjective, varying by social identities, namely partisanship and race. To show that Americanness exists on a spectrum, I use a number of methods, including conjoint experiments. I examine the independent, relative, and additive effects of a number of ethnocultural and morally imbued achieved characteristics, exploring how such features move people up and down the American hierarchy. I won't go into details, but this is just a plot showing that individual characteristics do indeed influence one's perceived Americanness. To show that Americanness is dynamic and can be influenced by political discourse, I use experimental priming methods. That is, in addition to measuring baseline attitudes, I show that political discourse, particularly about immigrants, influence perceptions of Americanness. Those in the pro-immigrant condition read what I refer to as the worthy immigrant narrative, which uses language like the generations before, all Americans, hardworking, law-abiding immigrant families, keying up ideas about past immigrants, i.e. Europeans, work ethic, self-sufficiency, and lack of criminality. Those in the anti-immigrant condition read a passage that depicts unauthorized immigrants as physical and economic threats against Americans, using language like illegal immigrants, problems for safety, cost us, incarceration, also keying up ideas related to criminality and lack of self-sufficiency and framing Americans as hardworking. These primes, particularly the worthy immigrant narrative, are informed by an original computational text analysis of nearly 28,000 political documents, um, that is web pages and press releases from Democratic and uh, Republican politicians. I look at how exposure to those messages change perceptions of Americanness. For instance, this graph shows the effect of the stigmatized triad, which is the combined effect of being long-term unemployed, having a criminal history of assault and using welfare for a US born citizen in blue, and the effect of being a legal non-citizen without those characteristics in orange, um, holding all else equal between you know, the two um, uh, constructed uh, individuals by condition. The gray bar is the difference between the two. This graph indicates that native foreign citizens with the stigmatized triad are positioned above legal non-citizens in the control, but below them in the worthy and anti-immigrant condition. To examine how perceptions of Americanness are subjective and vary by partisanship and race, I use a variety of survey instruments. For instance, I have respondents rate how American they believe whites, blacks, Latinos, and Asians to be, and examine the differences by relevant social identities. For instance, here uh, are some results from an all non-Hispanic white sample split by partisanship showing great heterogeneity in terms of group position, so what groups they put at the top, what groups they put at the bottom, as well as how much distance uh, is between the groups uh, within this American hierarchy. I also have respondents rank the importance of various characteristics considered important for being truly American. 
Um, and this is different from how uh, these questions are usually asked. Usually they're asked to be rated, um, but here uh, I ask people to rank them so we can see the relative importance of given characteristics, right? And so that means that people kind of have to put their money where their mouth is. You can't just say everything is very important. It's like, well, how important is uh, having citizenship or being U.S. born? And here are uh, some data split by race showing how different racial groups prioritize these characteristics differently, again, showing a lot of heterogeneity. So in sum, I examined the contours of Americanness, showing that it goes beyond binary distinctions, that it is dynamic and can be influenced by political discourse, and that the evaluations are subjective and vary systematically by partisanship and race. I use high quality and relatively large survey based data sets from YouGov and NORC to provide insights into how adults in the United States are constructing and assigning status uh, within the national community. So that's a little bit about my work, and I look forward to uh, engaging with the panelists and um, all of you in uh, the, the, the Q&A. Thank you very much, Dr. Asbury. Um, Dr. Godinez Pooch, you are up. Fantastic. Let me share my screen. And oops. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So today I want to talk a little bit about um, a body of work I'm developing on uh, opportunity hoarding by white communities. And I and specifically will present about one example of opportunity hoarding that I call white fortressing. In the US since 2000, at least 145 new cities and towns have been created, uh, in some regions more than others. For instance, in Georgia, uh, specifically in the metropolitan uh, uh, region of Atlanta, we have seen 11 new cities being created since 2005 in four counties of the region, nine of which are white and affluent communities. Uh, the newest community, though, I, I must point out, is a community of color that was approved in a referendum in 2022. And so this really spurred um, a few questions for me. To begin with, what triggered these municipal incorporations? Are motives different uh, depending on the type of community? Are these ways for segregating people? How do actors talk about what triggers them? But also, what are the effects uh, you know, in practice of these cityhood movements on taxes, on services, on communities, wealth opportunities, on health outcomes, and others. And so today I will focus on the causes, but again, my body of work is a little broader, broader than that. So from previous work, we know that um, uh, there are different reasons why communities decide to incorporate. They want more power, they want to control land use, they want better services. They want to limit their taxes going elsewhere. Um, they want to avoid annexations or predatory inclusions. Um, and also they want to limit diversity. I propose to put race, racial threat, and systems of racist structures at the forefront of the analysis, because I claim that it's the underlying driver of city formation and local governance systems. Um, and in particular, I say, in my work that demographic changes have, that have taken place in suburban areas um, have created, have brought more low-income folks, immigrants and communities of color to these suburban areas, which has allowed um, more and a growing political power in communities of color, from communities of color. And that has created perceptions of racial threat um, in these previously white communities that construed this as a collective menace to their political, economic, and social standing. Um, and, and there is research showing that changes in the status of racial relations can truly empower group agency. And so I argue that this is exactly what's happening here, and that's what pushes uh, communities uh, to for cityhood. And I call this phenomenon white fortressing. So white fortressing is when state legislators, local politicians, movement leaders, and other local actors intentionally include, exclude communities of color from their space through seemingly race neutral policies and rules to form a city. Um, so 
I started this conversation saying that there are a couple, a few new communities of color as well. So how does my theory fit in here? So I claim uh, that, and, and in fact, there's quite a bit of research showing that border changes impact communities that are left behind, that are often, unfortunately, communities of color. It, it impacts them fiscally, it impacts their governance, um, they are depleted from resources, and uh, it also impacts the services that they receive. And so I argue that white portressing movements um, that quite literally, uh, through which quite literally communities take what was once a common pool of resources away to create the new city. And, and it um, so by forming the new city, they take away these resources and uh, these resources are no longer managed at the county level, but rather at the municipal level. And it creates competitions for shared uh, state and county resources between these communities. And that is what I argue pushes communities of color to organize. There's also research showing that racial, that a lot of these movements have been triggered by racial justice motives and have functioned as tools for civil rights. And so in order to test my theory, I do a case study um, in Georgia. I did some field work there and talked to, um, and, and really looked at the 10 new cities that were incorporated when I did my new, my, my field work, which uh, didn't include the last one that I mentioned at the beginning. So I conducted uh, also some pilot interviews in other states, Colorado, California, and Louisiana, and then 30 in-depth semi-structured interviews with members of pro-encounter incorporation movements and other local actors then coded those interviews, looked at my, the mem memos I wrote um, to really try to understand these triggers and what brought about cityhood movements. So let me briefly tell you some of my findings. In particular, I find that uh, what triggers white fortressing is three main things. Dissatisfaction with local services, dissatisfaction with tax redistribution, and a fear of losing white political power and privilege. So let me go a little bit deeper into this. When I talked to participants, particularly when they talked about services, um, they really referenced areas and service areas that have been linked to racial motives as well. For instance, a white state legislator told me what was once a very vibrant suburb then became a slum almost, a lot of drugs and that kind of thing. Um, same when it came to talking about tax redistributions. All reference to tax redistributions really had a, a mention of race, whether that was a direct mention of race or a geographical mention of race. So for instance, here a white fortressing leader told me, it's worth noting that we are an affluent area and while we are only 7% of voters, we were 11% of the budget and they think we are a cash cow in the South. And again, in the Southern parts, of, of this region, those tend to be the communities of color. But there was also this very clear fear of loss of white power. They talked about losing representation from home. Again, direct allusions to race and a sense of losing the advantage they once had. The county was, uh, this is a quote from a white council member who said the county was a majority white county for a long time, then it became majority black, and I guess it was payback time. And again, um, even when folks talked about uh, being dissatisfied with the services that they were receiving, they always attributed that to race as if a low quality of service was related to the race of those that were providing the service and not related to other motives such as the fact that county level governments don't provide the same level of services that a municipal government would provide. These conversations were rather resentful, and this resentment was also observed by participants of color. And really through my conversations, the rhetorics used were referencing these feelings of loss and rights, and they really made use of colorblind racism, but also started to make direct racist allusions as well. So for instance, I had a, a council member telling me, some people wanted a city government that could help rectify that disparity that shouldn't have occurred. It shouldn't have occurred any more than the opposite, referencing reverse racism here. Another person told me, these areas down here get an inordinate amount of money 
there's the racial component because the poor areas tend to be African American and so they have higher crime. Uh, but most of the money comes from our area. And there was always this sense of before and after in my conversations. And indeed, if we look at um, data on uh, percentage of non-whites per county, we see there, there was th that demographic change I talked about initially, and it was always referenced. So uh, a black state legislator told me, if too many blacks move in a white community, they can only tolerate so many before they start to bail out. So what makes white fortressing successful? Truly, there were two main elements from my conversations that um, that made these movements successful, access to power and racist institutional structures. Um, again, the politics and structures mattered a lot. There were different rules for different communities because incorporation bills in Georgia are done through a bill. And so state legislators get to create the rules for each movement. And truly, there were different rules for each movement. Um, and then the referendum only included folks inside the city, even though these movements can affect entire communities outside uh, these new cities. And then it was also a very elite movement. In fact, the mayor of a new city told me, this is all about power. We were able to get in the ballot because we did not pose a threat to white Republicans. We stayed with the most powerful senator. And finally, it was because of him, he let us through, but he could have killed this right there in, in the last minute. And he reminded us every time we saw him. And in fact, partisanship also mattered. Most of the bills that passed, um, incorporation bills that passed, came from the Republican Party rather than the Democratic Party. So finally, I want to talk briefly about the triggers in communities of color. As I was talking about, uh, it seems that they had different motives and different dynamics that pushed these movements. First of all, they, they all shared that it was much more complex for communities of color to incorporate. Um, they also were triggered by this increasing competition with the new white cities. And in fact, all communities of color were the last communities to incorporate compared to the white communities. And they truly saw this as a mechanism of empowerment to fight against inequities. So for instance, a black member of an incorporation movement told me, this county has had a very, very tough time dealing with the issue of race, especially black folks and white folks. That was never part of our sales strategy. We never brought it up. It was never even mentioned. Part of our thinking was, well, once you see us. So anyways, to conclude briefly, I find that white fortressing is a modern form of segregation to exclude communities of color, and it's born out of racial threat feelings and pushed by racist institutional structures. Uh, the leaders of white fortressing use rhetorics of colorblind racism, but they're also more and more growingly likely to uh, mention racial motives directly and you view them as legitimate. Um, and communities of color are triggered by other reasons compared to white fortressing movements, but they also face many more obstacles to incorporate. And importantly, there's also some, some research showing that they may not benefit in the same degree as white communities once they do incorporate. So I will leave it at that, but I'm very much looking forward to the other presentation and the discussion in a little bit. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Godinez Pooch. That was really uh, fascinating. Uh, Dr. Perry, you are on. Unmute yourself. <laughs> Happened again. Uh, so I'm so grateful for the research that's been presented thus far, and for the for the opportunity to to share. Um, some things that we've been working on. Uh, off, off, off the bat, I just want to say, I, I think a, a, a constant thread throughout all of this research would be the um, would be the the, ve the very uh, real consequences of uh, perceptions of white racial threat, political threat, ethnocultural threat, the idea that uh, for white Americans, political, because of demographic shifts, uh, because of economic realities, their political and ethnocultural power is being threatened. And, and so oftentimes what we see is a response uh, to that. And for my own part, this is this is what I think we're trying to understand. So for the past few years, we've been studying this thing, white Christian nationalism. 
And uh, we've studied it primarily in one way. And I think there are two other ways that it could be studied and must be studied. And so I think there is, uh, I, I really want to invite people in on this conversation and, and hope that more work will be done in the areas that, that, are, that remain to be explored. The, the, the thing that we've been able to, I think, uh, get our minds around a lot is, is white Christian nationalism is a political ideology that, that motivates uh, and uh, values and behavior. Uh, primarily among white Americans. And so what, what we mean by that, we've talked about the flag and the cross and, and uh, taking America back in various uh, peer-reviewed studies is, is how Christian nationalist ideology corresponds with and I think drives uh, various anti-democratic, authoritarian, conspiratorial, uh, boundary-enforcing views uh, that revolves around a conception of the United States as an us versus them battle and it is ours, the nation is rightfully ours, it is being taken from us. But so much of that depends on perceptions of threat. Uh, experimental research by Mara Alkair and her uh, co-authors have shown that that when you communicate to a group of Christians that they are going to be the minority in a few years in some way, that they respond with greater Christian nationalism and Trump support. Right? Like it is a it is a response to the threat itself. It is a circling the wagons kind of uh, response to to say who does this country belong to? It belongs to us. Let's remember our history. Let's remember our heritage. And protect that kind of thing. So. Christian nationalism, white Christian nationalism can be understood as like this ideology, but it is also an emerging identity that people are ident that, that people are actually embracing, uh, beginning with people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and, and Lauren Boebert, all the way down to people writing books, arguing why Christians ought to be Christian nationalists. And this is a, a movement that is uh, growing as people actually embracing the term and arguing for that explicitly. But lastly, Christian nationalism, I think, is an effective uh, political strategy. And so uh, that does not require that you believe the ideology or embrace the identity. And so what we've seen in the last 10 years from Donald Trump, I think is an example of Christian nationalism, white Christian nationalism is, as a political strategy. I don't think Trump believes any of that stuff. He doesn't have to. What he, what he, what he is good at, though, is he is good at communicating uh, to Christians who feel that their cultural and political power is being taken, white Christians in particular, who feel that their cultural and political power is being taken from them, robbed from them, uh, that he will defend them and fight for them. And so uh, what we've been trying to do in the last uh, year, we've uh, worked with a team of experimental social psychologists, and we've put together several uh, studies that uh, working on and ongoing. What I want to present to you is some findings from a, a study that is coming out in Psychological uh, Science, uh, the journal. And uh, what we did, what we wanted to understand is we wanted to understand how uh, rhetoric that that talks about threats against Christians uh, specifically, it doesn't mention race, uh, can actually prime and activate um, a threat response among white Americans to where they actually feel like white people are under attack by just mentioning Christian threats. And so uh, what this actually utilizes is the understanding that that Christian and white and religious and racial identities are conflated in really powerful ways in the United States. We know this to be true, but but it actually has political implications. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to unpack this. So I just want to share a uh, Briefly, some studies that we, some experiments that we ran, uh, and what were the findings from those, and what are the implications for political rhetoric and uh, leading up to the 2024 election, what we could expect from Trump, and what we can actually, what we would expect this rhetoric to do uh, with the people that he's targeting. So study number one, what we did is we recruited a group of white Christians from prime panels. This is what, an online forum that we we're able to, to access uh, groups of people to take these kind of uh, experimental things. And what we did is we we gave assigned each to um, a treatment or a condition. One group got no uh, article. That was the control group. And then we also uh, randomly assigned uh, these white Christians to an article that talked about bias against uh, Christians, bias against white people, and bias against black people. And we wanted to see if telling them about bias against one group would also lead them to uh, believe that there is greater bias against the other group. In other words, we wanted to identify whether these identities, threatening one actually threatens the other and how that works together. We used a multi-item, for this particular uh, outcome, we used a multi-item scale looking at uh, prejudice and various perceptions. Of bias. And here's what we found. So uh, first, I just want to point out uh, what uh, the, the, the condition did what we wanted it to do when we told uh, this group of white Christians that Christians were being persecuted right here. They were more likely to think Christians are being persecuted. When we told them about uh, white people being persecuted or a bias against white people, they were more likely to think there was bias against white people. But look at this arrow. What this arrow shows is that telling a group of white Christians about anti-Christian bias actually made them also think about anti-white bias. 
right? In other words, it made them think white people are under attack, not just Christians, but white people without ever mentioning race. Uh, in another study, our second study, what we wanted to do is we wanted to replicate this and see if other people pick up on this. Is this something that is just white Americans or white Christians perceive, or is this something that other groups perceive? So we wanted to include black Christians in this study. And here's what we found. We found that the condition works again, uh, replicating this study, it works for white Christians. Uh, telling them about anti-Christian persecution makes them think about anti-white persecution. But it doesn't for black Americans. Black Americans are just rather unlikely to believe that white Americans face any kind of bias. Uh, and so telling them about anti-Christian or even anti-white bias wasn't really uh, going to move them in that way. And so this, in other words, this could be an effective dog whistle. It's something that white Christians respond to, perceive, uh, and it activates them in some way to kind of uh, perceive this, this, this kind of pre prejudice or discrimination, but not uh, non-white Americans, in this case, black Christians. But we also wanted to do one more thing. We wanted to see if politicians could use this to their advantage. And so what we wanted to do is we, we, we created another experiment uh, in which this group of white Christians, uh, another group of white Christians, uh, was shown an advertisement campaign ad for a politician. And the campaign, the politician in these various conditions, one of the politicians said that they were concerned about anti-Christian bias. The other one said they were concerned about anti-white bias. Another one said attacks on uh, religious freedom, and the last one, the control group, uh, uh, basically threats to the economy or those kinds of things. And so the outcome, we looked at perceived concern about bias against Christians and perceived and bias against whites or uh, attack on religious freedom. Here's what we found. We found that when this politician, when, when white Christians read a campaign ad in which a politician expressed concern about attacks on Christians, that he was going to stick up for Christians, that he was going to fight, he was going to, uh, he was going to respond to anti-Christian persecution. It also made them feel like this politician is concerned about uh, anti-white bias. Uh, and uh, in, a, in a, another outcome, we, we, we wanted to know whether, whether those people perceived that the politician would fight uh, for white Americans. And uh, it did, telling them, about, telling them about a politician or a politician advertising that he would stick up for Christians, uh, that he would stand against anti-Christian persecution also made white Christians perceive that this politician will fight on behalf of white people. Okay, so what have we shown thus far? So, so basically, we've got a situation in which politicians uh, speaking to white Christian audiences, which in the United States are predominantly Republican, they, they, and they are becoming increasingly more so because of political sorting. You've got a situation in which savvy politicians can speak to a white Christian audience and only mention anti-Christian threats and at the same time make them think about anti-white threats, right? And make them think not only about anti-white threats or that they're being persecuted, but it can also make them think that uh, this politician is going to stand up for, uh, Christ or for, for white Americans and is going to fight on behalf of white Americans. Now, think about the kind of rhetoric that we have consistently seen from Donald Trump, not just the, the, the really clumsy racist dog whistles about bad hombres and terrorists and those kinds of things, but the subtle things that he's able to communicate to Christians. There is an assault on, this is all throughout his campaigns. 2016, there is an assault on Christianity. In 2020, the left has not given up their relentless crusade against Christians. And just a couple of months ago in December, he said, uh, I'll immediately, when I get back in the office, I'll immediately end the war on Christians. Under crooked Joe Biden, Christians and American faith are being persecuted. And you remember this picture, this famous picture, this op-ed during the height of George Floyd protests, right? So this is what Trump was telling People, what's going on is racial riots and violence on behalf of racial conflict, and yet he holds up a Bible. What is he communicating there? Well, without communicating about race, he's able to communicate to uh, his predominantly white Christian audience, not only that he will show religious or faith leadership, but also ethnic leadership, racial leadership. He will stand up for people like them. Uh, and so what I think we're we're seeing in, in, in this research, and I think, and I hope more research to come, is how Christian nationalist rhetoric, not only the promise uh, that, that power will be restored to Christians, and I think implied white Christians, um, not only that promise, but the how those threats uh, 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 of how the left and the Democrats are taking our country and these uh, people are stealing our heritage and transforming our nation, those, even when they explicitly reference religion and have nothing to do with race, still communicate the same kind of message, right, in, in, a, in a, a way that is even more, I think, subtle than dog whistles at times. Uh, and so I, I would love to see more people dive into this. Certainly, I'd, I'd love the idea of exploring white Christian nationalism as an ideology. I think more work needs to be done on it as an identity. People people embracing it and calling themselves that, that's fascinating and really scary. 
Uh, but I'd love to see more work done on what would make people to do that and the consequences of that. But I think also uh, understanding how this kind of rhetoric uh, mobilizes the base uh, in ways that maybe they don't even perceive at times, I think would be fascinating and needed. So I, I look forward to any questions that you may have in, in uh, discussion with the panelists. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Perry. Um, so I want to ask the panel a few uh, questions to talk about, uh, to talk to each other and with each other and with us about uh, each of your each of your work. And the first thing I want to ask you each, and we could just go in the same order, um, is how do you, what connections do you see uh, between the work that you've done and the other two panelists? You have, you know, really different approaches and somewhat different frames, but but there's these threads that are part of why we brought you all together. Um, and and sort of how do you, where do you see similarities or differences um, in your turn in your interpretations of what's going on with Americans' views of of hierarchies and how those intersect with politics? Um, so, Dr. Asbury, you are first. Thank you um, for that question, and thank you um, both for sharing your really um, important and fascinating research. Um, you know, some of the most immediate connections I see is with Sam's work, right? Um, especially when I look at how political discourse influences how people are perceiving what it means to be American. And, you know, I have a larger argument about the racial implications in our immigration discourse, right? Um, people often see um, uh, anti-immigrant discourse as racialized, right? Um, illegal immigrants being code for Latinos, or they can understand that, like, uh, you know, like there's some division between whiteness and um, non-whites within that kind of a framework. But I also argue in other work that uh, the worthy immigrant narrative is also racialized, you know, language as well. So this morality that is wrapped, uh, wrapped up in Americanness and whiteness are inherently linked, right? And I think that's why the Christianity part is kind of uh, a, a something that people can, um, you know, uh, cling on to because, you know, traditionally, like historically, what it meant to be a citizen was you needed to be white and you needed to be of good character. And that meant being a Christian, right? <laughs> and so like these things are very connected. And so here um, with my work saying that immigrants are hardworking, law abiding, they share the same values as us and our ancestors is a way of trying to say like these people who are trying to come in are like us good white people. They're not like those lazy, criminal, welfare dependent who's coming to mind <laughs> when we use these kind of, um, you know, foils to uh, this positive rhetoric um, and how powerful that is in changing people's attitudes, right? Um, so I, I think that the worthy immigrant narrative is actually quite problematic, right? I think that it is um, playing into um, white supremacy. However, like my research shows that it's effective. Like it does get particularly Republicans to soften their views towards immigrants. <laughs> Right? And so like this, uh, the, the racial politics that are embedded in everything from our immigration discourse to our moral discourse are just so um, uh, intertwined. And I think that's some of the commonalities that I see between my work and um, Sam's work for sure. Uh, Dr. Godinez Pooch. Yes, absolutely. So first of all, thank you so much for um the two great presentations. Well, I think we all study, although obviously in different ways, social identities and ideologies and their influence on American views of hierarchies and politics. Uh, while most of my work has obviously focused on local white movements um, and its effects on uh, politics and racial outcomes, identities obviously intersect especially as Sam was was uh, uplifting. And it is really important to think about how these intersections also affect politics, political discourse and rhetorics, and of course, racial outcomes as well and power dynamics among different groups. Um, and I do believe that the larger body of work that I develop on opportunity hoarding, uh, particularly white opportunity hoarding is very much um, pushed through these intersecting identities. Um, and, and, you know, these movements are very much pushed by this group identity and the perception of threat 
and who is deserving of rights, who is deserving of being a, a fully American, who is deserving um, or who is losing what through uh, the empowerment of other communities. And those visions, those feelings are truly what are empowering a lot of movements, whether that's at the local level or whether that's, uh, you know, uh, po politicians at the federal level that are really using these rhetorics to fuel their movements. And so I think as Victoria was saying, the racial politics are really embedded on everything. Um, and we can see them from different perspectives, whether that's uh, these low, very hyper-local movements that are creating <laughs> uh, segregation at the local level, whether that's the vision of what being an American or what level of uh, Americanness one has, or whether that is um, feeling like um, there is a connection between race and um, and Christianity as well. Great, absolutely. Thanks, uh, Sam Perry. Dr. Perry, yeah, I I, their I, last name, and now I'm messing it up. It's okay. So I, I think the, I think something uh, we'd already talked about, like the perception of threat and and demographic shifts leading to this uh, overwhelming perception of white racial threat that leads white Americans to respond. But I think uh, also uh, a, a common thread that we're seeing throughout these studies is is the reality that certain identities are are functional stand-ins for other identities, which makes uh, political activism on behalf of one group effective and subtle and uh, and and um, and stronger than it would have been otherwise. Because I think, as you know, as as Al as Gordon Alport, a famous psychologist, said back in the fifties, he said, you know, the re the reason religion often is a uh, is so strongly associated with forms of prejudice is because it always stands for more than faith, right? Like it's it's always an overlapping identity with all of these other things. It means culture. It's it's it is uh, it is a region of the world. It is it is values. It is all of those kinds of things, and um, sometimes for better and sometimes for and, and often for for worse. Um, when the out when the dominant in group is uh, mostly of one religion, and they can use that as a as a, as a signal or as a code or language. Um, I, I think I've said this before, but I think we tend to think of dog whistles as negative things. I like to think of urban and terror and, and illegals and those kinds of things. But I think the, the most effective dog whistle that the right has ever developed is the word Christian. Uh, it is because it because it means it means people like us. It means uh, it, 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 it conveys the idea to a particular audience that people with our values who 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 think like us and want the things that we do, who who live like our lifestyles and, and embrace those kinds of things and, and really functionally look like us in, 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 in many ways. So I, I think something that we would would benefit from discussing and, and, and digging into a little bit more are the, are the various ways and what the things I'd love to hear about from the two uh, other panelists is are, are the ways that they see um, uh, kind of cultural language about, say, ethnoculture, things that are coded where Louisa talked about uh, colorblindness and that kind of language. And Victoria talked about like how, you know, various value priorities get placed on certain identities and what it means to be truly American. I would love to see how those kinds of things correspond with racial realities and animus uh, towards in-groups and out-groups, uh, how that's serving. Either of you want to want to speak on that? Uh... You know, one of the most fascinating things that I've seen in my data recently is looking at the relationship between how Christianity is prioritized and how different groups are rated in terms of their Americanness. And I find that um, for non-Black respondents, so whites, Asians, and Latinos, the more important being a Christian is, the less American they rate Blacks. And I just thought that was the most fascinating thing. Because I'm like, mm -hmm. well, blacks tend to be like, like they they tend to identify right. with being Christians. Like that's a, a big part of you know the black experience. Um, but there's something else happening there, right? <laughs> like the importance of what it means to be Christian is not just about identifying with uh, the religion. It is about how like what people think is truly a Christian, right? right? Like who is a real representation of a Christian, who is really moral, 
right? Um, and so I, I think like that's really fascinating. And it made me think of your work as soon as I saw that. Um, you know, something else really interesting is the more importance people put into uh, speaking English, again, not Black respondents, right? Uh, it's going to be different for Black respondents. But the more value they put into uh, speaking English as being a, a characteristic that's important for being truly American, the lower they rate Blacks <laughs> in terms of Americanness. And it's just like, wow. But like most of us are native born descendants of slaves who have been speaking English for centuries. <laughs> and yet, and so like, there's something else happening there, either in how people are reading Black people, either as moral beings, as either tr like, a, you know, or maybe they think that uh, we don't speak good English. I don't know what it is. But like there's something happening there between, like there's a disconnect, right? Because you would assume that the more important those traits are, the more American Blacks would be considered if you were thinking about it in um, like logical and statistical ways. But it's not about logic. There's some other kind of racial logic that's underpinning um, uh, the importance of these characteristics. For me, I think, uh, you know, I, I spend a lot of time comparing, if you will, uh, these these movements that I study with movements that took place um, years ago, right, during the post-war era. And for me, something that is really interesting is that uh, there is this move from going from utilizing rhetorics of colorblind racism towards being much more direct. Um, and, and that was even more powerful for me as a Latina woman myself doing the interviews and, and participants really didn't uh, seem to mind telling me these very racist ideas very directly to my face. Um, and so I find I find it quite uh, revealing that we're doing we're seeing that transformation towards feeling truly empowered and having this group agency to talking about these racist ideas very much directly. And so that's one of the things that that um, that has been really sort of highlighted through my research, at least for me. Yeah. Um, thank you all. Well, a couple more, actually, I could ask you all questions all afternoon, but I'm going to do one or two more and then I'm going to open it to the audience. Um, I'll just say now I'm thinking of it. I think because we're a big group, it'll be easier for people to use the question and answer and type their questions there. And then I'll I'll take them more or less in order or try to combine any that are similar, et cetera. Um, so I'd love to hear you. You talked a little bit about this um, already, but I'd love to hear the each of you talk a bit about how you think about the relative weight of race, racism, white supremacy relative to um, religion, region, nationalism, like all of them sort of relative to each other and in, in shaping these worldviews. Do you think sort of, uh, you know, white supremacy is sort of at the, at the root of all of this or is there some other stuff going on? Um, I also think, I didn't put this in the question I told you I'd ask, but I also think a lot about, you know, class position. Um, evangelical white Christians are the most likely race, uh, uh, group in the country did not have a college degree. Um, so is that that part of what's going on here? Um, so I'd love for each, you each to just talk about sort of how you think about what drives the kind of um, attitudes and, and actions that you see um, and how the, how different things intersect with each other, if that makes sense. Um, no, it, maybe we could go, uh, yes, Dr. Perry, if you want to go first, since you spoke last most yeah, uh, long ago. I, I'd love to hear what my other panelists have to say too. I just I, I had I had a quick thought on that. I I think class is very much a part of this. So that we find in study after study after study that uh, Christian nationalism, however you want to measure it, uh, is negatively associated with income income education, all of those indicators. I, I think of socioeconomic status, and that shouldn't be surprising. Um, also, it, it happens to be highly correlated with a certain kind of Christianity, like a, a very charismatic. Uh, Pentecostal uh, uh, cosmic battle between good and evil kind of kind of thing, which also tends to be uh, located among white Americans, primarily among the working class. So this is where I think class is really important, and I never want to get get rid of it because I, I think yes, I, I believe religion matters, and yes, I believe these kinds of religious beliefs matter, and yet at the same time, I believe the rhetoric is used oftentimes as a as a very strategic class wedge. 
the the I think really great book, uh, political scientists, uh, a hacker and uh, Pearson, uh, Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson, let them eat tweets. Uh, talks about uh, talks about the the use of like if you know the the conservative dilemma is that you protect the the interest of power, but you in a democracy you need to get people white people primarily to vote against their own economic interests a bunch of working class white Americans to vote against that so how do you do that well you 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 lie to them or you distract them and you say don't look at these people up here who are who are uh, you know uh, who who you would benefit from like forcing regulations on and better tax, you know, more, more better tax incentives and those kinds of things. No, you should focus on those immigrants, those Muslims, those, uh, uh, those people changing your culture. Uh, and Christian nationalist rhetoric is a part of that. It's a, it's a way to distract white working class Americans from the reality of their own class inequality, right? Like it's, a, it, it is something that I, 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 um, I can use as a savvy politician to say, uh, like they do in Oklahoma, so this is what we live. My 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 kids are in public school here, and we have a, a, a state superintendent of public instruction here who has no interest in in improving public education, and he knows this. But what he has to do is he has to distract constantly from that. So he is a full time culture warrior on Twitter. He hired the libs of TikTok lady uh, to to do his you know kind of curriculum uh, development, like. And he basically spends his day talking about woke indoctrination and pornography in the schools and how he's ending, you know, all of this kind of uh, race warfare. And all of it is is an attempt to distract the people that he is uh, not wanting to serve from the, that reality. And he uses Christian nationalist rhetoric constantly. So I think class is a really important part of this and why it ends up being such a strategic way to, to leverage those cultural issues rather than talking about the class issues. And I'll just intervene to say, you know, it's it's the same set of people who are using anti queer and anti trans rhetoric and sort of trans panics and all of that to to again to sort of foment fear and unrest and bring people into a political coalition that they that they might not otherwise be in, um, or at least to to mobilize them when they're there. Um, uh, Dr. Godinez Butch or uh, Dr. Asbury, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um... Well, I mean, I'm certainly biased because I do a lot of work on structural racism and ethnicity. And so I always tend to put the most weight on that. That being, and, and you know, this country has grappled <laughs> with the issue of race for a long time. The structures through which the society is built, the politics, the institutions, they, they are all uh, structures of racism. Um, now, that being said, and I mentioned it before, I do think intersectionality is so important. Um, and, and we know from previous work that, and, and as Sam was saying, race, class, socioeconomic status, religion, um, all of these tend to overlap in different ways. Um, and so I think it's just really important to understand that all these social movements, all these ideologies are highly influenced by multiple aspects of privilege and discrimination. Um, and it truly impacts who participates in these movements and how what are the goals of these movements um, and how the issues are of these movements are framed in a way that they become effective, right? Whether folks are utilizing religion instead of directly talking about race or whether in some other instances, they just go straight to race because they know that will work as well. And so I do think that, um, that for my work and just work in general, it's really important to move towards thinking more about these intersectionalities because obviously things, it, it's, it's really hard to assign a relative weight when we know that these intersectionalities are very much um, important. Thank you so much. It is sort of a, a tr terrible question because you can't really completely weigh, but I think it is important to think about how these all engage with each other. Uh, Dr. Asbury, do you want to say anything, add anything? I think that um, class is very much a part of the conversation, obviously. But I think race and racism um, and anti-Blackness in particular is always, always there. And that these poor white people, their biggest fear is being at the same level or God forbid, below Blacks. And so they're going to do a lot of political, um, a lot of psychological, a lot of social work 
to ensure that that does not happen, right? Um, and it's not just poor white people who will do that. It's also going to be basically anybody who is not a native born black. And even then your native born black, that they got a little bit of money. They're going to try to distinguish themselves from that too. But like, we cannot forget anti-blackness and how that is really what everybody is trying to, like blackness itself is what everybody is trying to escape. And though um, the whites who have a uh, lower educational attainment, have lower incomes, those are the ones who feel most vulnerable to being seen as equal to blacks, um, that they're the ones who, you know, would be most, uh, I guess, active and uh, trying to distance themselves because they're the ones who feel most vulnerable. But we have to remember anti-Blackness and not just white supremacy in this conversation. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. I'll ask one more um, question of the three of you, um, which is uh, thinking about um, this election year, thinking about, uh, you know, Beyond that, even, are there things that you would like to see people doing either in terms of, you know, research that, that can and should be undertaken or actions that you think people should be thinking about um, as we you know, face yet another sort of, you know, election where this is in some sense the central or one of the central um, issues that's 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 driving the competition? Um, I'll let any of you go first who unmute themselves first. or no one has an answer. I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll, I'll weigh in and I'd, I look forward to, I, I really do want to hear what everybody else has to say about that, about this one, because I think we're, we're all searching for answers as well. Um, you know, my hope, at the very least, my greatest hope is, is, is that not just Trump, obviously, like I, I, I think that's horrifying that, that he's now the, uh, the, uh, a absolute candidate. Um, my hope is that not only Trump, but but anybody who uses that kind of it, Trumpish rhetoric, like that, his whole brand of politics. Like my hope is that this is it. It, it faces a resounding defeat uh, in in twenty twenty four. Like I know that's just wish. I mean, it's not just that's not just wishful thinking. In twenty twenty two, election deniers and Christian nationalists didn't have a good midterm. Right, like that. It was not good for them. Uh, I, I I hope more than anything that again because I think it, like politicians will respond to what they think is successful uh, in terms of campaigning and the kinds of rhetoric that will be used to mobilize the, the people that they want to mobilize. Uh, and so I I would love a situation in which I think it helps us all honestly um, across the board. I think it helps us all if politicians uh, are actually confronted with the reality that people don't want to hear that kind of. Uh, um, People don't want to hear those those that, that the kind of hate the, the things that is just fomenting polarization and and uh, and inequality and, and making things worse and people more angry. Um, I, I don't I don't know what will send that message other than just losing, right? And so uh, I I think that uh, uh, is 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 a lot is hanging on whether or not that is a successful strategy in November. Uh, to the extent that it's not, I think people may back away from that and those kinds of candidates, right? Like in, in like what, what we don't want, I mean, I think because of gerrymandering and all those kinds of things, all you got to do is win the primary. And especially in a place like Oklahoma, it's just, you know, we, it's no chance. Like after you win the primary, that's it. Like you, you, you've got it. And so what you've got is you've got just people racing to the MAGA uh, kind of thing to, to get the base, to mobilize people, to get uh, folks worked up. So um, if parties will be, um, we'll say like, look, that doesn't win anymore. And they will exercise some actual leadership and to say like, we are not going to put forth the candidates and this is where we're going to go. I mean, that would obviously be spectacular. Um, uh, and I, I don't know other than just mobilizing as best we can, uh, against such candidates. Uh, I don't, I, short of that, I, I'm not sure what else, what else could be done, but I'd love to hear ideas. <laughs> Uh, either of the other two you want two of you want to add anything? I mean, I'll I'll say quickly. It's I mean, I think that's the the million dollar question that I wish I had an answer to. But um for me, I think I would love to I guess another line of, of research that I'm very interested in is youth civic engagement, particularly critical forms of civic engagement. So I think I I I'd love um more efforts on uplifting the voices of those 
um, young people that really are the future for, for the country um, and, and really empowering the many movements that already exist for, you know, that have been um, created by those young peoples. And, um, and so that's one thing I look forward to seeing while also I am very much aware that there's, <laughs> there's a lot of things that should happen this year and I'm not sure um, will. Thank you. Dr. Asbury, um, do you want to jump in? I guess I'm, I'm just so pessimistic um, in terms of like, I hope that people just aren't tired of hearing Tom, Trump's rhetoric and like the way that he portrays himself. Um, and that, you know, the hope would be that it would be that they don't actually like that message, <laughs> but I actually believe that a lot of people like his message. And um, I think that we have to just be real about what our country is. Um, we live in a white supremacist, anti-Black world, um, and it's not limited to white folks. <laughs> and so all of us are chasing white supremacy to some extent um, and trying to run away from anti-Blackness. And we, we're going to continue to see that in our policies. Um, we're going to, you know, maybe uh, like to see it a little more dignified and a little more coded. Um, but I'm not very optimistic that like that um, um, fundamental um, value in our society is going to be weeded away. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, on a similarly uh, not optimistic note. Actually, I have two questions from Michael, so I'll ask uh, both of them because I think they're um, they're related. Um, and then I see uh, a hand from uh, David Jeb Schwartz in a minute. Um, uh, so, um, Michael asks, the social strife works well for crisis-driven industries such as big oil, big fire firearms. Um, with the free flow of cash in politics, do you think that the social strife is defined is a defined strategy by bad actor industries? Um, and then he asked a second question, which is, is Christian nationalism too nice of a label? Um, so I thought we could, we could, uh, any of you, and we don't, you don't have to all three answer every question if you don't want to, but you can. Um, any of you want to answer one or both of those? Um, yeah, so I mean, I, 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 I think all the time about whether or not Christian nationalism is the right word for the kinds of things that we're talking about. Uh, I think, yeah, people, I, I just saw this in the chat, Christo-fascist or something like that. It just seems like a silly term. Like, I, you know, I, I'll just, I'll just say that, like, I've never really warmed up to it just because it's like Christo-fascist. I don't know. Like, that's just, like, is that, is that a flavor of like, it just, if it's fascist, it's fascist. I don't, I don't know. So I've never particularly warmed up to that term, even though I know there's a big push to use that kind of thing. Other people will say, like, why don't you just call it white supremacy? Because that's usually what you're talking about is like white Christian nationalism. Just call it white supremacy, you know, just call it anti-blackness, call it those kinds of things. Uh, and yet there's this kind of weird racial component. So here's the thing that, that, that actually like put that leads me away from kind of the, the Christo-fascist thing. Oftentimes we find, and this is what we talk about in all of our studies now, uh, we find that that religious language um sometimes means something completely different for people of color and, and, and white Americans. Like it means something completely different. Like I could show you a study, I actually have a, a slide prepared for this, but like, uh, uh, and it's intersectional. It's, 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 it's fascinating because people can read the same questions about Christian nation, Christian heritage, Christian values, and it makes them do want completely different things. So for example, white Americans hear something about Christian nation and it makes them go libertarian hard. Like, they, like when we ask them, should we value equality or liberty? Uh, everybody else, you know, almost everybody goes liberty as soon as they go like Christian nationalism, except for black women. They go hard to like as, if they subscribe to Christian nationalism, they go hard to like to equality in the ex in the exact opposite direction. Same questions. Right. So, so there's this there's it, it understanding that religion is racialized, understanding the Christian language is a part of this. Other times, though, it's exactly the same. So, for example, like people of color, white Americans across the board. When we ask questions about, say, sexual orientation, transgender issues, gender issues generally, uh, the more people subscribe to Christian nationalist views, the more they agree. They agree in a, in a reactionary conservative way against that. 
So something that needs to be studied, and this is I'm I'm begging for people to do this more, is 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 um are the axes on which Christian heritage language, that kind of like rhetoric, uh can is it is is at one time a divisive thing and like a racialized thing, at the other time it, it actually is useful for building multi-ethnic coalitions of exclusion, especially against transgender, gender minority kind of individuals. That's absolutely happening, right? And that's one of the reasons why it's also effective in that way is because for people of color, you can use that kind of reactionary Christian nationalist rhetoric. Can you actually get them on board, right? Like it's not a divisive thing anymore. Um, so whether to call it Christian nationalism, I don't know. That's a great question. I think we're still keeping that. Um, uh, I'll let somebody, if if anybody, oh, the the, the bad actor industry, I'll let somebody else jump on uh, that one. Either of you want to jump in or should I move to the next question? Okay. Um, uh, the next question I've got then is um, uh, uh, with the uncommitted movement, you know, this is from Valentina Cantori, with the uncommitted movement gaining grounds in the U.S. and the genocide in Gaza worsening, does the Palestine-Israel Israeli conflict play a role in supporting or not supporting the white Christian narrative of Christian threat, Christian war, and its racial underpinnings, and if so, how? Nodding, maybe I see everybody nodding. Maybe the answer is just yep, and there's not much more to say. <laughs> um, does anybody want to? Okay, um, great. Uh, then I see um, David Jed Shorts. Do you want to? You look like you want to ask your question live rather than typing. I think that's okay if you could be brief. Yeah, you you can hear me okay. Good. Uh, uh, I had a couple of questions. One is uh, having to do with, uh, I'm relatively ignorant about uh, differences between evangelicals, Christians, and uh, Catholics. Uh, and I'm, I am aware that the Catholics practice confession. Uh, it's an integral part of their uh, religion. Uh, I'm under the impression that the evangelicals, and it's essentially all of the Protestant sects, do not. Uh, I would appreciate whether uh, clarification whether whether my view is correct or not uh, from anybody. I mean, and it would be your opinions, but uh, I, I just I, I I've never heard of anybody any Protestants ever doing confession, and I'm interested. I happened to write something about this uh, in the wee hours or the early hours of this morning, and perhaps anticipating this this discussion. Uh, at any rate, uh, the other question I have is uh, evangelical Christians. Uh, uh, are are they usually rural? Are they found in uh, southern cities as well as rural areas? Uh, and you you will, the, the speakers have indicated that they generally are uh, lower middle class or working class, or or uh, uh, and people who have been left have missed the missed the train when it comes to getting in into the into the uh you know into the into this new economy they're, they're not doing so well it, it, or all those can you can any of you comment on those uh questions or thank you right. david I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that quickly uh, uh yeah within protestant traditions they tend not to practice confession not that i'm aware of like confession with a priest or 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 that kind of thing that's just not something that they have Done, and that's part of Protestantism is the idea that you you have a relationship with God directly rather than through a mediator like a, a priest. And so there's not somebody who exists for that. Um, uh, the 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 connection between evangelicalism and region. Um, what's going on in 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 the United States? Uh, we we often control for things like region, like living in the South or whatever. Really, the most important distinctions are rural and suburban versus urban. Now, uh, like there, there are still a large concentrations of evangelical Christians in the South, especially in the Southern Baptists, uh, like Bible Belt area. That still means something. But primarily, I mean, like you know, rural Illinois is just going to be as 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 evangelical and reactionary and conservative as as uh, Georgia in, in in those kinds of ways. And so, I think you've got. Um, you've got distinctions that are urban versus rural and suburban versus Southern and not Southern anymore. Uh, so I think that's something that, um, 
not all evangelicals are, and we should be careful about evangelical. Evangelical is like I said, this very broad category, and it's taking on more of like a political, racial category now uh, than a theological category. But I think what you mean to say is like these kinds of like conservative Protestant Christians, uh, the the more charismatic uh, kind of biblicist ones tend to be lower socioeconomic status compared to those who are a little bit more uh, progressive and wealthier. Victoria, did you have a, something to add there? Well, Sam, I actually have a question for you. Do you find that white Catholics respond uh, to your manipulations uh, with like, you know, white bias and threat, whatever, um, the same way that uh, white Protestants or non like Catholic Christians respond to it? Right. Great question. So um, I, I, I don't know about the distinctions between how they respond to various experimental kind of conditions. Uh, I can tell you, we find on surveys that like once you account for Christian nationalist ideology, the connection between um, evangelicalism and Trump support just vanishes completely. In other words, like uh, white Catholics, mainline Protestants, evangelicals, if they agree on this Christian nationalist kind of thing, the nation belongs to us, it's being taken from us, you know, that kind of thing. They behave just just alike. It's, it's exactly the same, which leads me to suggest that it really isn't about theological distinctions or heritage so much as it is about the idea that America belongs to people like us. Uh, if you agree with that, then you believe that the person who's promising is to give it back to you is going to be the, the savior there, right? And so, like, I think that's so. I think Catholic and evangelical don't mean a whole lot of difference when it comes to politics, like not like it used to. But are you seeing um, like high proportions of white Catholics also subscribing to this white nationalist ideology, believing that the country is theirs as well? Right. Uh, not as many as white evangelicals, but you do see like Catholics are kind of all over, like they're they're just not unified in a way that like evangelical Christians happen to be. So you have like progressive Catholics or m more like liberal progressive Catholics, but you also have traditional Catholics. Matter of fact, uh, there's a movement among Catholicism, traditional Catholic Catholics called uh, integralism, uh, which is like Christian nationalism, except for Catholicism. It's like the Catholic uh, teachings ought to be the law of the land. And 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 it's it's much smaller. It's not as uh, it's not as uh, mobilized as evangelicals. But there is that that strain among Catholics as well. Yeah. Um, I have an, another question um, from Hannah Peterson. She asked a series of questions, but um, uh, one is, uh, for Victoria specifically, I'm curious if the relationships you found between race and hierarchies of Americanness are in any way mediated by religious identity. I think we could also ask a similar question to, um, Dr. Godinus Puch about, um, you know, what intersections do you see specifically driving the, um, the move for white people to enclose their, <laughs> enclose their cities? Um, how much, you know, is, is it primarily anti-Blackness and white supremacy? Are there other, um, do you see religious, do people talk about religion at all? Do they talk about other sort of aspects of their position or their identity? Um, uh, uh, and then I think this may have been covered, but I'll just read the question in case there's something else to add. For Sam, um, I know that your research has covered non-evangelical groups in the past. Do you have any plans to conduct the same experiments with other populations, Catholics, Mormons, Jews? So you, you mostly answered that, but if you want to add anything. Um, but first, Dr. Asbury and Dr. Gordinus Pooch, please. Um, so I have not broken my data down by how people of different religious groups are looking at Americanists. Um, but um, uh, religion does figure into my uh, research in uh, several key ways. One, um, in the conjoint experience, Experiment where I look at how different characteristics move people up and down the Americanist hierarchy, one of the attributes that I look at is religion. And there I look to see, um, are there differences between um, people who identify as Protestant, as Catholic, as uh, Muslim, or as uh, no religion? And one of the things that I found is that um, basically there's no effect really or no difference between um, identifying as a uh, Protestant, Catholic, or no religion, right? But there's a huge like penalty for identifying as Muslim. 
Um, and like the penalty for identifying as Muslim, even though I'm controlling for it, uh, for race um, and uh, the other features is basically as big, if not bigger than uh, the race penalties actually. Um, and so what this kind of gets at is this idea that like um, uh, Christianity might be losing its salience in how people are defining what it means to be American, but not so much in that, um, uh, you know, it's okay to be any religion, right? It's more like, it's okay to be Christian or to be non-religious. You cannot identify religiously as something else, particularly as a Muslim, right? And so like Christianity, it's both like, it, it's there, but it's also losing its salience. But um, uh, it, it doesn't mean that we're just becoming open um, and allowing people of all different races to have the same status in our society. And then the other way that I see it come up is in um, when I ask respondents to rank the importance of various characteristics for being truly American. And one of the um, things that I see is that for all uh, respondents of all backgrounds, on average, the lowest ranked characteristic of the 10 that I give them is uh, to be Christian. Right. But you see huge differences between um, uh, like blacks ranking um, this characteristic as the least important, uh, important characteristic versus Asians, for instance, rating it as the least important characteristic. So blacks, they rate it low and on average it receives the lowest of the uh, the ranks. But um, only I want to say like about 40% of Blacks uh, say that it is the least important characteristic, while you see over 60% of Asians saying that it's the least important characteristic. And, you know, one of the things that you can start to do is like, well, people are thinking about the identities that they hold and that they don't hold, right? So um, the vast majority of, Christ uh, of Asians are not Christian. They don't identify as Christians, right? While the vast majority of Blacks, they do identify as Christian. And so they're prioritizing these um, these different features in different ways that would allow their group to have um, a different status in the hierarchy. And so religion does play a role in um, how we are defining Americanness. But I can't say how people of different religious backgrounds um, I uh, um, are ordering the actual racial hierarchies. For me, I've also not really looked at the role of religion in my work, although I would love to. Um, but I've certainly heard a lot of allusions to class and income um, in, in a lot of the conversations that I've had with folks on the ground. Um, first, this idea that I mentioned uh, about white people's tax money being redistributed to communities of color and really feeling like they were financing all the services for communities of color while um, they did not uh, receive the same amount of services. Um, and that this was certainly one of the, the largest reasons why communities decided to, to organize and incorporate. Um, there was also this idea that was often mentioned in my conversations that communities were very different because some were affluent and some were not and that that difference really affected a whole lot of spheres. For instance, some folks um, talked about how um, sharing a same school between different communities did not make sense because communities of color is what they told me were very different and had to be um, needed, the kids in those communities needed to receive a specific type of education that the kids in the white communities didn't need to receive. And so there was certainly this idea of, of the importance of class of income. Um, and certainly it was also very important when it came to being, um, to being able to create a city as well. And, and a lot of communities of color told me that uh, state legislators would not sponsor their bills because they uh, believed that their communities did not have um, enough income, you know, like they would not be able to amass enough revenue to be able to provide services, even though these cities actually only need to provide four types of services and they can rely on county level authorities to provide other types of services. Um, and so they refused to to sponsor these 
incorporation bills and it just became so much more difficult for communities of color to actually uh, be successful in their movements compared to white communities. Thank you. And we have one more question in the in the Q and A, um, and I want to I'll I'll ask this question and then maybe ask each of you just to um, offer some uh, concluding remarks about um, the the conversation we've had and the um, and and your thoughts about uh, you know cross fertilization or research going forward, et cetera. Um, so the the question first is just. Um, uh, uh, could you speculate wildly about how this generalizes outside the U.S.? Um, is it a function of America's holding American uh, America's uh, holding American out as a multi-ethnic, multi-racial identity to other forms of religious nationalism have this racial element, or is it just a some Americans thing? I um, mean, I would expand that question just to like how how U.S. specific do you think your findings are? Um, not just in terms of religious nationalism, but in terms of the, um, you know, the hierarchies of Americanness that you see, Dr. Asbury, or the um, the white fortressing uh, that that you see, Dr. Godinus Pooch. So I'll ask you each to speak briefly on that, and then I'll ask you each for any uh, wrap up thoughts. Um, why don't we go in, uh, Dr. Asbury, first? Yeah. So um, obviously. The, the details um, of what defines a, a person of, or, you know, a community member uh, will be context specific, right? But I think the overall um, notion that uh, there are gradations within the national community is one that transcends the United States. The overall um, like process of boundary work of political discourse, being able to shift people's statuses um, within the national community, I think again would transcend the United States, right? Um, uh, the fact that uh, your background is going to, um, you know, shape how you are ranking groups, um, I think would transcend the United States, right? Of course, if you go to, I don't know, uh, Nigeria, you're not going to have white, black, Latino, Asians to rate, right? You're going to have like, you know, um, country specific groups, but I'm sure that there would probably um, end up being some kind of ordering um, and people, if they're of one background, um, are going to, you know, have uh, perceptions of what that order should look like. And um, people of another background might have some other um, perception. Um, but I do think that the, the things that I'm looking at are uh, more um, general processes but I'm looking at it within the um, American context. Uh, Dr. Perry? Uh, yeah, so I, I think, um, yeah, what's going on in the United States with regard to what, whatever we call white Christian nationalism by white whatever name, I think is really one Americanized instantiation of something that's taking place around the world. Uh, we see what in the flag and the cross, we call it uh, kind of in a, in a form of authoritarian ethno traditionalism, but it's basically a response to like perceived demographic uh, and very real demographic transition, perceived loss of cultural and political threat. Uh, and you see various responses to it in, uh, ac across the board. Oftentimes with quite religious language, you see uh, Rogers Brubaker, uh, who's is a brilliant analyst in these things. And he's talked about uh, kind of what he calls an identitarian Christianism in Western Europe. And and there it's like nobody's in church. It's not it's not like these people are calling themselves Christian or talking about France as if it's a Christian nation because they're in church so much. It's not evangelical in that sense. It's it is it just means not Muslim. It means I'm born here. It means it's my culture and not yours. And that's basically what it means here, right? So it's uh so I I you know I actually think this is kind of this 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 requires a comparative cross-national study of, of various kinds of religious nationalism. It's not just religious nationalism in the sense that, I mean, there's been some studies of religious nationalism that I think veer more towards like almost like a civil religion kind of mindset, but I think really kind of ethnicized Christian re religious nationalism, because uh, European nations are, are in, uh, religiously at least, they are 50 or 60 years just ahead of where the United States is going in secularization. And Christian and those kind of things. I think a lot of the immigration uh, challenges, struggles, backlash that they're seeing there. This is something that is just only going to heighten here. I, I feel like we could learn something really important about what the United States is going to be facing in terms of conflict 
over the next few years if we really paid better attention to what's going on in Hungary and Brazil and, and India and uh, Western Europe and all these places. So I think it translates um, well in a, in a way that could be really instructive if we pay attention. Thank you. Um, Dr. Godinis Pooch. Yeah, so similarly to my colleagues, um, I definitely think the idea of opportunity hoarding is very much translatable to other societies. Although, as, as both of um, Victoria and Sam said, uh, the specificities of white fortressing um, in particular are very much, I think, you know, part of the US and is probably even specific to certain regions of the US even. Um, however, this idea of opportunity hoarding um, really affects a series of, uh, of, of field, in, like including, for instance, the environment. I mean, I think we will see a lot of opportunity hoarding uh, happening across the world um, now that we're facing these terrible environmental threats. Um, I know Mexico is the closest example that I have because I'm Mexican. Um, and these dynamics of opportunity hoarding very much take place in Mexico as well, but they tend to be more triggered by class and colorism. And they take they tend to um, manifest in different ways than through movements of white fortressing like we see in the US. And, and even in the US, opportunity hoarding manifests itself in, in different uh, through different mechanisms as well, right? So today I just presented the cityhood movement example, but there are many other examples through which opportunity hoarding takes place. And, um, and so, so certainly this conversation has uh, you know, sparked more curiosity in me, and then I definitely want to go back to the drawing board, <laughs> if you will, and and uh, continuing developing this body of work. Thank you so much. Um, do uh, Dr. Asbury, Dr. Perry, or Dr. Gurdjieff Spooch, do you have uh, any any or all of you do you have final um, thoughts you want to share as we close? Sure, I'll start. Um, I think this question of what it means to be American and um, Americanness being on a, a spectrum or a hierarchy is something that we often don't think about, especially if you um, are a citizen, particularly if you're a native born citizen. It's not something that we think about, but it's something that matters, right? Um, it, it is saying something about um, who we believe um, has priorities over rights, resources, and um, recognition in our society. And so it is not just the intellectual conversation to be had. It's one that is um, affecting um, our lives, all of our lives, if we're here within this these national borders and even those who wish to come into our national borders. And so um, it's something that I, I hope that we continue to, to think about um, and reflect on and think about who's included and who's excluded from the definitions that we are um, constantly creating. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think um, Etan Hirsch's new book, uh, it's, like, it's within the past couple of years, Politics is for Power. It's a, it's a great book, but it's one of the things I recommend to my students, just because I feel like he really like, I want to encourage all of my students and whoever I, the audiences I talk to and whoever I get to to speak to is is real politics is not doom scrolling social media and getting into fights for three hours and saying I did politics or like reading you know some of the latest news. It's meeting people, it's interacting with folks, it's actually having conversations, it's being activistic and getting out there. And so I, I hope we can encourage all of our students, whoever we have a sphere of influence. Like like Victoria said, this is people. People matter, uh, and we're we're not going to. There's there's a, a billion ways that we're not going to persuade them <laughs> to do anything, but but I, I think I think we have a good shot if we're actually in people's lives and 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 in some and doing some work like this, some public sociology and, and some some activist political work. I think this is what's required. Yeah, and I'll just add um, that I feel very similarly. I mean, I think um, for me it's really important to think of the policy implications and policy changes. Um, that we need to do, but but think about it by involving communities themselves mm -hmm. and not by trying to be extractive or trying to, you know, implement whatever we think from our research is is what should happen, but rather really truly empower 
communities incorporate them in processes of policy design um, throughout the process of the policy design from the inception of, of a, the design of a policy all the way to the implementation. Um, and so hopefully these conversations, uh, you know, are just like a way to start identifying which, which are those communities that we need to start engaging with and then truly go ahead and engage with those communities such that um, our research and our evidence has a real impact. Thank you so much, the three of you. This was exactly what I was hoping for this conversation. You've all been really, really informative and really great. Um, so we could do a round of uh, applause with our icons or our hands. Um, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for coming. We have uh, three more of these scheduled through or planned throughout the year. The next one is March 28th um, and you can find more information on it um, if you go to that registration link that we sent. Um, and I uh, hope to talk to all of you more in the future. So thank you very much.